Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot. I'm the program manager for Maven Project. Thank you all for joining us today and our friends at Cherokee Health Systems for hosting today's session, Dermatology, a case-based approach with Dr. Stacey Salab. Dr. Salab is a clinical assistant professor at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Will Cornell Medical Center in New York City. After completing her dermatology training, she joined Memorial Sloan Kittering Cancer Center Division of Dermatology, where she served as an attending dermatologist for over seven years. She's been in private practice in New York City since uh, 2004 and has continued to lecture and teach dermatology residents and students. She has received the Dermatology Teacher of the Year Award three times, and she is on the board of the New York Dermatolo Dermatological Society and is an active member of the American Academy of Dermatology. We're so very thankful to have her as one of our volunteer speakers. So when you're ready, Dr. Shala, please begin. Very good. Well, um, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I, I'm going to use a different format than just my talking and your listening today, because I found over the years as I've done teaching, um, it's more interesting to think about individual cases, and it's more interesting and you're more likely to retain the information if you're a little more engaged with it rather than passively listening to it. So the disclosures that Kristen commented on the accreditation. Um, and today we're just going to look at a variety of cases. Um, I'm going to focus very much on description, um, generating differential diagnoses, and we can talk in some of the cases about, um, about treatment. Um, when you're learning, I think, anything in medicine, I'll, I can talk about dermatology in particular. As we look at different cases, um, I think it's important to have in your head a scaffolding of where things go. Um, when I did my first uh, exposure to dermatology, it was a, sec a second year medical student, and it was just a bunch of lectures, like let's talk about melanoma, let's talk about psoriasis. And they asked us to buy um, an atlas that wasn't organized in any way. And I almost sort of felt like trying to look at a rash was sort of like, okay, what page is that on matching the wallpaper? And it's better to have a scaffolding or a framing to put these different things on. So starting at the bottom of the tree, we're just looking at dermatology things. Basically, we think of it in terms of rashes or growths, inflammatory or neoplastic. And there's another with um, genetic dermatoses, um, you know, uh, traumatic things. Growths are benign or malignant. Um, rashes can be non-infectious or infectious with an infections, virus, bacteria, fungus are the main ones. And non-infectious, we're thinking about pink scaly things, red things and swollen things. Um, and autoimmune conditions, connective tissue disease like lupus and, and bullous diseases. Um, as a dermatologist, I spend a lot of time thinking about what the pathology might be. Where is the problem? Is the problem in the epidermis such as a wart? Is it in the dermis um, such as a dermatofibroma? Is it something deeper like a lipoma? And then just briefly to look at a schematic of the skin, the top layer here is our epidermis. The topmost layer is called the stratum corneum. It's this dead flat layer of squash cells. Between the epidermis and dermis is this basement membrane, which we have learned so much about from our autoimmune blistering conditions. You can see it doesn't just lay flat like a piece of paper um, in healthy skin. It sort of undulates to just have more places for it to attach to the dermis, which is where our support structure is, where our agnexal, um, apparatuses are such as hair follicles, uh, sweat glands, blood vessels, um, erector pili muscles, um, and then the fat layer. What I've noticed is I've, I've been now doing Maven consults for about a year, um, and I've noticed you guys make a huge effort to try to give me some history, um, describe an exam, and tell me your thinking, and it, I'm so appreciative of that. But one of the things I've noticed is that um, actually nobody um, is using um, the dermatology vocabulary. So I just wanted to reintroduce it to you. I imagine at some point during your schooling, schooling you've heard it. And we're gonna try as we're um, interactively looking at these cases today, we're gonna try to give as precise a description as possible. One of the exercises I make the dermatology residents do early in their training is when I used to work at Sloan Kettering, I would be home with my kids and the resident would be called into the ER to see a consult and they would call me on the phone and I was very dependent on them and their description to understand what they what the, they were seeing um, in the patient in front of them. And it was very frustrating when I couldn't from their description create a visual picture of it. So 
being very precise in dermatology vocabulary um, can make a huge difference. It also makes a big difference in terms of your thought process. So we differentiate primary lesions and secondary changes. Primary lesions, if it is something completely flat, it's called a macule or a patch, depending on the size, less than one centimeter or greater. Close my eyes and run my finger over this, I feel nothing, shouldn't even know it's there. Um, if something is raised, it's either a papule, um, if it's smaller than a centimeter, or a plaque, if it's greater than centimeter. And at some point, it's just big and juicy and deep, like a big cyst, and we call it a nodule. Blisters can be small vesicles or bullae, and often a blistering condition, you might have both conditions. So briefly looking at examples, um, an example of a macule here, if you look on the top right picture, um, solar lentigenes, which are sunspots or liver spots, vitiligo is a larger patch, it's a depigmented patch. Um, an example here of papules would be the common seborrheic keratoses. Um, larger plaques elevated, an example of one that might be more in the top layer of skin, the epidermis psoriasis, um, and something that might be more in the dermis um, would be an acne scarring. And you can see hypertrophic and keloidal scar here, which are more thickening in the dermis. Um, cysts would be an example of nodules, these big, deep um, calcified cysts in the scrotum that you're seeing here on the right. An example of vesicles and bullae would be um, herpes zoster or shingles. Um, you can get more specific about your description of raised things. They can be flat top, they can be dome shaped, they can be long and spiky called filiform. They can be on a little stalk like a skin tail called pedunculated. They can be smooth or verrucous. Um, a molluscum or sebaceous hyperplasia might have a little depression in the center that we call um, umbilicated. Um, and then there can be secondary things. So for example, there can be crusting like you would see in impetigo. There can be scale as in this example of psoriasis and dermatitis, you can see little fissures. Um, if you're missing some skin and it's sort of superficial, it might be an erosion where you're partial uh, missing part of the epidermis. And if it's deeper, um, it can be more like an ulcer. You can see scratches called excoriations. You know, if you see that, it, it, it's pretty itchy. Um, atrophy, where the skin is too thin, can be a secondary change. And lichenification, which is also a sign that it's itchy, is a sign that somebody is rubbing at the skin and the skin is being reactive and coming back with more layers of skin. Again, clinical examples, macules and patches. On the left, it's a patient with neurofibromatosis where you're seeing the cafe macules and patches. I guess on the right is vitiligo. Um, here is a, a dermal nevus on the left, a smooth dome-shaped papule. On the right is a very well-circumscribed erythematous scaly plaque with whitish or micaceous scale of psoriasis. Um, and here are blisters, um, vesicles with the smaller ones, um, the larger ones are bullae. Um, and these are actually um, bullous arthropod bites where you're seeing um, the blisters with not a whole lot of redness or secondary change. And here's a big nodule of a ganglion, um, ganglion cyst. So we're gonna try to use this vocabulary today. Um, so this is our first case. He's a 22 year old man. Um, he's otherwise healthy and he's had this rapidly progressing rash of um, just a week's duration. Um, I will tell you, this is my all time favorite rash. Um, it was the first dermatology diagnosis I ever made. Um, my uh, then boyfriend, now husband had this rash. We were um, together during medical school and um, he is not a doctor and I had that atlas. And I thumbed through that atlas until I found the picture that looked like his rash. Um, and this was the first diagnosis I ever made. I was wondering if any of you would like to take a stab at trying to describe this rash. So there is a comment that says vesicle versus postule, but I don't know if that's for this picture or not. I'm sorry, can you repeat that, Kristen? Oh boy, vesicle versus postule, question yeah. mark? So vesicle would be more uh, filled with clear fluid and a pustule would be more of a yellowish color filled with pus, similar to what you might see in a, um, see in a pimple or a lesion of folliculitis. Sometimes vesicles, if they're there long enough, some inflammatory cells can come into them and they can, tr can transition to pustules. So for example, in an early state lesion of herpes simplex, where you would see grouped vesicles on an erythematous base, if you watch them you know, day by day, they might start to turn into pustules as inflammatory cells come in to try to deal with the, vi with the virus. So they're Sometimes you can have a mix. So we have some comments in the chat. There is targetoid le lesion, 
And then annular possible scale ethermatosis, then pink slash salmon mass macules, and then slightly raised macule with central clearing. Oh, well, there's a lot. These guys, you guys are very participant today. I love it. Um, All right, um, those are great. Um, those are great comments. So our primary lesions here um, would be um, uh, uh, flat-topped papules or plaques. So on the trunk of this man, um, we see part of his abdomen and we see most of his back. We see um, these, as you described it, erythematous salmon colored, I means I have a feeling you know what this is, um, being more specific describing the erythema. So erythematous um, to salmon colored, round to oval macules and patches or papules and plaques with this scale that in some of the lesions is uniform throughout it and other lesions appear to be more annular. Um, anyone know what this is or what the differential diagnosis of it would be? Um, so we have, oh, it's coming in. I should have, I should have worked on my vocabulary. Patyrus, Patyrus, TR versus syphilis. You guys are great. You know, this is pityriasis rosea. I'm loving it. All right. So clues to pityriasis rosea. Why did I? Clues to pityriasis rosea. Um, for one is the lesions are of different sizes. And it wouldn't surprise me if this patient initially came in maybe having that one larger patch on the abdomen and Probably you might have said, oh, it looks like a little eczema. Here's your triamcinolone cream. Let me know if it doesn't go away. And a week later, you probably got this panic phone call, hopefully not at 10 o'clock at night, saying, oh my God, this is all over my body. Help, help, help. What is going on? And that's the classic story with, um, with pityriasis rosea. It tends to come more in younger, healthy people, um, but we can see it across all age groups. It tends to have a spring fall predilection about a quarter of people that have pityriasis rosea have some kind of a viral prodrome, meaning that in the past preceding few weeks, they might've had a viral illness. Um, it can be contemporaneous with the rash, but it tends to be more after. And that's why we think it's a post-viral um, post syndrome. Um, I'm gonna show today both pictures of Caucasian skin, but also skin of color. Those rashes look different when there's more melanin in the skin. So this is pityriasis rosea as well. Um, and again, you see these um, uh, erythematous, but now the erythema is a little more dusky, um, round to oval scaly patches distributed on the trunk. Here is another patient with skin of color. You lose a lot of the erythema. You're seeing way more of the scale here, a little bit more of a um, hyperpigmentation. So it does have a different appearance when you see it on darker skin types. One of you smartly mentioned pityriasis rosea versus this condition, which is secondary syphilis. And secondary syphilis can look very similar. We're seeing these pink round to oval erythematous scaly patches distributed on the trunk again in skin of color showed on the right. It's more hyper um, hyperpigmented. Um, there are other clues that you can look for when you're seeing the patient. You can ask them to open their mouth and you might see this mucus patches to look at their palms and soles, which um, is way more likely to be involved in secondary syphilis than it is in um, pityriasis rosea. You could look in the genital area to see if you can see the lesions of condyloma lata, which tend to be sort of moister and pinker than, than uh, condyloma, which are genital warts. Um, you could look in the scalp for moth-eaten alopecia, and the patient might not have any of those and still have secondary syphilis. Um, my teaching as a um, dermatology resident, um, in which I teach my residents, is that if you think of the diagnosis of pityriasis rosea to, at a minimum, have a discussion with a patient about secondary syphilis. Um, as a resident, I was more dogmatic, like everybody gets um, uh, gets blood work for secondary syphilis. Um, when I worked at Sloan Kettering, I actually got into trouble for that because um, I was seeing some VIP person with the rash and I just said, oh, we check this on everybody. Um, and he was very offended and um, uh, uh, complained up, up to my chairman. 
Um, so now I'm a little more nuanced. I have the discussion, this could be. Um, the residents tell me when they go to the city hospitals in New York that about a quarter of the patients that have what looks like pityriasis rosea actually have a positive test for secondary syphilis. My experience in private practice is that it's more rare. But at a minimum, you, um, uh, you definitely need to think about it. So the two things to for sure think about when you think about the diagnosis of pityriasis rosea is just knee jerk, think about secondary syphilis. The other is, is you can have a drug rash that is a pityriasis rosea-like drug rash. And this is um, from a paper um, of an online journal of a classic case of this, um, uh, and it was to uh, lisinopril. Um, in the paper, they commented that there were some distinctions um, from the classic pityriasis rosea, but I wouldn't hang my hat on any of those. So um, typically this won't have a classic herald patch or that first initial larger patch that a patient might come in. And they talk about the color being angrier. Um, they talk about it being more itchy, which would make sense because we would see the eosinophils or itch cells um, in a biopsy of drug-induced pityriasis rosea. Um, likewise, you might see a peripheral eosinophilia on a blood smear. Um, and most importantly, if you stop the drug, the rash should go away a whole lot faster. And ACE inhibitors seem to be the number one cause of pityriasis like drug reactions, but these are other medications that have been reported to, um, uh, to be causing it. And it's a pretty broad list and things that patients are pretty commonly on, you, you know, things such as beta blockers, um, penicillin derivatives, um, omeprazole, NSAID. So um, just to, when you see a patient with pityriasis rosea, you just to take a look at their drug list, including their daily medications and PRN meds, and just consider, um, consider it in your differential um, diagnosis. Um, so just to summarize, this is more common in young adults, but it can be seen in any age group. It often, but not always starts with a herald patch. If you see that person with that solitary patch and it runs through your mind and you say to them, you know, there's a small chance this might just be more than that. And you might call me in a week that this has exploded all over your body. That wouldn't worry me at all, but please, please let me know. Then maybe they call during hours rather than after hours. Um, the rash can spread over one to three weeks and it can take over two months to resolve. So you also need to sort of manage that expectation that it's gonna stick around for a little while. It can be generalized, but it often starts on the trunk and can move to the proximal extremities neck, tends to spare the face, but that's not a hard and fast rule. About a quarter of cases have a viral prodrome. This is a self-limited rash. When I think about other pink scaly rashes, such as eczema, psoriasis, that tend to be more chronic conditions. I say to patients, if you were gonna pick a rash to have, this is a good one. It's got a beginning, middle, and an end. You, it, will, it will stop. The treatment is symptomatic. Um, and because it lasts two months, I've tried all costs to avoid, avoid systemic steroids because you're just suppressing the rash for the 10 days, two weeks you give them the medication. Um, and then the rash comes back and sometimes it seems to be worse. So topical steroids you can try if they're symptomatic, moisturizers, antihistamines, just supporting them. Um, patients with skin of color can heal with post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation and that can take months and months and months to go away. So I make I really stress to them, sun protection will um, help, help uh, minimize that. And again, as we talked about, importantly to consider in the deferential pityriasis rosea like drug eruption and secondary syphilis. Questions about pityriasis rosea before we move on to our second case. I don't see any questions. I think we're good. Onward, okay. Um, this is a 32 year old, otherwise healthy male with an extremely itchy rash of at least three weeks duration. He's not quite sure um, that is spreading. And so this is what he looks like on his trunk. Anyone want to take a stab at describing this? Popples slash postules, X-rated red popules. Um, sorry, let's get closer to that. Erythematous popules. Yep, erythematous papules is great. If you touch these, they might be kind of firm. They, they might be sort of transitioning from papules to nodules. The individual papules don't seem to have a whole lot of surface change on them. They don't seem to be little blisters. They don't seem to be open sores. They don't seem to be scaly or crusty. Um, 
but the background skin doesn't look so normal either. We see it, we see some other secondary changes here. What are these linear things here? Excoriations, exactly right. Um, so we see that the background skin is not so normal. It's a little red, maybe a little lichenified here. And then there were some excoriations. So when we have the patient with the rash, maybe they're holding up their shirt to show you the rash and you say, no, 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 I need to look, I need to look at you all over. So you do, you start to look all over and you look in the genital area and you see these similar lesions. You see these nodules both on the scrotum um, and, on the, um, and on the penis. Um, and you look at the arm and maybe you don't see those full on um, papules or nodules, but you're seeing a whole lot of crusted erosions. Um, you're seeing the skin being really beat up here. So you're seeing il this ill-defined erythema. You're seeing erosions in various stages of healing. They might be fresh, they might be crusted, they might be just starting to heal over, which sort of goes along with the three-week um, three week duration. Um, and then finally, you look at the hands. And um, this is probably your biggest diagnostic clue. I have been working, working up here. Um, anyone know what you're seeing here on the hands? Scabies? You guys, got, you guys got it. It is scabies. So we're seeing the classic burrows here on the hand. They're not always there. All right, so you, um, you're thinking now, now scabies. Um, you, you made the mistake when you walked into the room and it was a very, very friendly patient who was really excited to see you because he's been so miserable. And in, he's, he holds out his hand and says, hey doc, I'm so glad you're here to help me. And you, you shook his hand. What, how long is it gonna take before you start to itch? A few days, a few weeks, a month or two. How long is it gonna take? A week or days or weeks. But we also have a question once we're done with this. All right, yeah, it's gonna take like three to four weeks, especially if you've never had scabies before, you're gonna be like, oh, that patient, I shouldn't have shaken his hand. Oh, and you're gonna to start to itch. So it takes a little while from when you are first introduced to the mites because what we're really seeing on the skin is the body's immunologic reaction to the scabies mite. Yes, Kristen, what's the question? Can you point out what a burrow looks like? Yeah, so if we look, the, the most classic ones are on the slide on the bottom and it's this little subtle linear th thread right here. There's another one here, this little subtle linear thread right here. If we're looking at the picture on the hand, it's these little subtle, you know, it's, it's a mite burrowing in the top uppermost layer of the skin, the stratum corneum. And so you're just seeing the path that this little mite is taking a picture on the left. You're seeing a lot of tiny little papules, some scale here. Um, but if you look closely, you can see these little tiny, little tiny lines. You see it a little less in this picture than in the other two. I don't know if any of you have gotten interested enough in dermatology to have a dermatoscope, which is a handheld magnifier that contains 24 polarized lights. Um, I, I, if I'm at the stage, I can't practice without it because I get so many clues to it, but it's changed how I approach scabies because I'm able with this light and magnification to actually see the mite. And so this would be an example of what I would see through my dermatoscope. So just, um, I would see the burrow starting at the top here, coming down and right here, this little triangular thing here, they call it a, a delta wing because I guess it's like the, um, uh, uh, a plane leaving a plume is this little triangular piece, which is the head of the mite. Here it is up closer. Again, you can see a burrow. You can see where she laid her eggs, and then you can see the burrow. And there's our um, and there's our mite. We know it's a lady, but a female because only the females burrow. This was um, they always use the term delta wing. So I I found this slide and I show it to the residents all the time. And it's this is meant to mimic. On the right, you actually see an uh, an airplane. Um, this would be the the plane and the um, and the plume. On the left is the scabies burrow and the scabies, and at the end of it, you can see the scabies mite. Um, Pre-dermoscopy, we would 
try to find a burrow and um, and take a 15 blade and gently scrape um, into the stratum corneum and put it on a slide to try to see um, to try to see the mite. This schematic shows how superficial the mite is. It's in that deadmost layer of skin called the stratum corneum. Um, and it is eating keratin. It, unlike a mosquito, it's not interested in a blood meal. It's just interested um, in the keratin. You can see um, here's our mite um, and she's laying um, a whole bunch of eggs in, um, in her field. This would be what we, when we used to do scabies preps um, where we would scrape that burrow and put it on a, um, a slide. You can put a drop of mineral oil on it um, and we would see the female mite. She's very um, round in shape. She's got four legs forward and four legs, four legs back. Um, she doesn't have a very long life. Um, she, um, we start with our adult female. She um, mates, it takes about 15 minutes. She's only gonna do it once. We don't know what happens to the guys. They, we know they don't burrow. I don't know where they eat or what they do. She's gonna burrow down so she can lay her eggs in that burrow. They're gonna hatch in a couple of days. They're gonna go through their life cycle with larvae with just um, uh, six legs instead of eight. They're gonna burrow back into the skin for a few days and within um, about 10 days, um, uh, she will grow up to be, um, to be a mite. So um, treatment of scabies, um, there's a couple of different topical things you can do and there's oral ivermectin. Um, I've learned over the years to be very precise if I'm using topicals um, of how I tell patients to treat. Um, if it's an adult patient, it's very uncommon for the mites to go above the neck because they really don't like sebaceous glands, but because um, children don't yet have um, very active sebaceous glands and um, children and infants, it's a whole different ballgame and um, they need to be treated truly from head to toe. Um, I tell patients to the most common thing I use is permethrin to apply it from the neck all the way down to their toes and not to min miss an inch of skin. I've learned over the years when patients haven't it hasn't worked. They tell the doc it didn't work and it, they didn't treat the genital area. They didn't treat the, the gluteal cleft. They didn't get between all those fingers and toes. So I tell them to make sure they're applying this from the neck down every inch. And I tell them all that, get under the nails, make sure you're getting every, um, every inch um, to leave it on overnight. Um, they can wash it off in the morning. And because it is not ovicidal, it doesn't kill the eggs that they need to repeat it in a week so that knowing that life cycle of the mite, that the new eggs will have hatched within a week and so after the, um, you know, the, the young mites um, before they start to um, complete the life cycle and grow and multiply. We've always told patients to also be careful about their clothing and um, environmental exposures like sheets and towels. Um, but there was a study um, a couple of years ago that actually did a boatload of work to try to, um, to, try to figure this out. They looked at over 5,000 mites and 22,000 eggs and exposed them to multiple conditions. And they found that in order to kill um, the mites, because remember the mites are eating the, um, uh, the dead keratin and our skin is always shedding. Um, so they have something to eat for a little while that um, if you expose them to um, greater than 50 degrees Celsius, 122 degrees Fahrenheit, which is um, a home dryer on high for uh, more than 10 minutes, you will kill them. If you also freeze them, expose them to um, minus 10 degrees Celsius or 14 degrees Fahrenheit, which is really cold and our, our uh, home freezers don't get there. So this is less practical and it would take five hours. And if you just put them in a plastic bag um, for three to eight days, it does take longer for them to die in hot human conditions. So I tell people, you know, two weeks just to be safe, um, they, they will eventually die. So they don't have to necessarily wash everything um, unless they wanna use it within those 10 days to, um, to two weeks. Um, oral ivermectin has been a, a game changer. Um, it's certainly much easier um, to take. You need to be very careful about the weight base um, dosing. And again, it's not ovicidal killing the eggs. So you do need to repeat it. So just to summarize, um, interestingly enough, there are a number of different Sarcoptes scabies mites, um, and they are species specific. So for example, dogs have their own Sarcoptes scabies um, uh, varcanus mite. Um, it causes mange on the dogs and that mite can bite humans, but it's not going to burrow and live and reproduce. So when we're transmitting scabies, you can't really give it to pets and you can't get 
traditional scabies from pets. The one that infects us is the Sarcoptes scabies var hominis one specific to humans. It's really common, at least a million people a year are diagnosed and probably more that we don't even know about. It is spread by direct skin to skin contact. If you had your gloves on and you didn't touch your patient, you would be fine. Again, it can take roughly about a month, but as few as two to six weeks to develop symptoms. And if your immune system has seen this before, it's a little bit more efficient. So it'll be more like in the two week um, front. I didn't put here, but the average person has 12 scabies mites on them. So even though you might see a whole mess of skin lesions, um, uh, most of them are old um, from, and that the mites have either died or moved on. Um, you can start down a path with other itchy conditions such as insect bites, um, various dermatitis, um, pyodermis, which are infectious things, tinea, and a condition called dermatitis herpetiformis, which is associated with celiac disease and is incredibly itchy. But remember, to, if you don't think of scabies, you're not going to make the diagnosis and treat it. So please have a low threshold of thinking about it. We talked about treatment top, with topical permethrin lotion applied neck down, um, repeated in a week, and then um, uh, linens and um, linens and towels. Um, or the dose of oral ivermectin, which is here. Um, you should treat all contacts knowing that, um, let's say this guy's girlfriend, um, you know, they've been um, uh, living together. And even though she, he'll say, well, doc, she's not itchy. Remember, it can take several weeks for her to start to be um, itchy. So you should treat her. Um, I think there's an ethical consideration. If she's not your patient, are you gonna write a prescription for her? Do you tell her she should go to her own doctor? Um, and that, that we certainly could debate. And um, the CELA mantra that my uh, residents all know is nodules on the penis are scabies until proven otherwise. There Questions? Is, yes. It, um, is the dose of ivermectin based on ideal weight or current actual weight for obese patients? That's a great question. And I actually don't know the answer. I would go with the current with their current weight, but maybe go on the lower, lower, you know, um, scale down a little bit. Next question. Uh, does one need to do a scraping always? No, if uh, I actually have stopped doing scrapings with my dermatoscope, if you're comfortable with the diagnosis, by all means do it. If you've thought about the diagnosis and you say, I can't make it for sure, but I can't rule it out, the treatments, it's worth it to do the treatments. We are good. All right. Um, uh, other um, other questions, good. Okay, case number three. Um, this I've, has come up, uh, actually I think at least three times since I've started doing Maven consults and it's a kind of cool diagnosis to make. You'll feel very, you look very smart if you can make it. So this is a um, 20 year old, otherwise healthy female who comes in with this hyperpigmentation on her face of several weeks duration. It's just not going away. Why don't you guys take a stab at describing this? Okay, nobody wants to take this on. Hyperpigmented macules, beautiful. So hyperpigmented macules, but what's interesting about these um, is their shape. Um, they're kind of, you know, bizarrely shaped. Some of them are linear and streaky. They're kind of patchy. They're, there's some of it here. There's none of it here. There's more linear streaking here. This is large, um, irregularly shaped patch here. Um, which raises the question, you know, our body inherently doesn't do streaky things. So it raises the question of this being an outside job. Um, so what could cause, what could have caused this? It might just be a post-inflammatory pigmentation and it might've been a prior rash. The rash might've been so mild, she didn't even notice it. And she's left with this pigmentation. Do you guys have any ideas? So waxing is a great idea in terms of, um, uh, you know, some form of an outside outside job. But who just said, did she eat mangoes and limes? Karen Lamp, what were you thinking? She's exactly right. This is um, a condition called phytophotodermatitis. Phyto is plant, photo is um, light, and dermatitis is a rash. And the classic story is somebody was eating mangoes, limes, lemons um, um, outside in, in the sun. 
um, they develop this phototoxic reaction. Sometimes the reaction is so mild, but it characteristically heals with hyperpigmentation. The, um, the types of um, fruits or, um, or vegetables or plants, um, which I'll give you the list of in a moment, um, the active ingredient is pulverocurin, that when exposed to UVA light, um, uh, causes cell membrane damage and DNA damage, which leads to cell death and stimulates the, um, stimulates the hyperpigmentation. In the case of our patient today, she um, was a college student. She went on spring break to some place warm. She was out on the beach with her friends drinking Corona and lime where you squeeze the lime um, into the beer and then you drink it. And as she squeezed it, some got, um, some got on her face and led to this reaction. Um, this might have been, would be an example of what she might've had on her hand where the um, lime juice might've splashed on her, um, on her skin. Here's another patient with the same condition with these kind of bizarrely shaped, uh, you know, this is in the more inflammatory stage, er erythema with striking hyperpigmentation. Here's another person where they must have had some form of an exposure on the shoulder. Again, these bizarre streaky things that kind of suggest to you that this is more um, of an outside job. Um, here's another patient with skin of color with striking hyper um, hyperpigmentation, again, where his skin came in contact with the toxin. Another patient, just um, a little more erythema, but again, this bizarre patchy streaky condition. Um, here's, uh, it, there's two different families of um, uh, plants that have this furocumarin. Um, the ones on the right are the ones we're realistically, clinically more likely to see. It's our um, the lemons, the limes, the oranges, the grapefruits. Um, there's some other plants in there as well. The ones on the left, I've seen a couple of times over the years. I had a patient that had this, that she was um, walking outside in a, um, she was at a restaurant that had an herb garden and she was walking around the herb garden, um, picking up little pieces of the herbs and sort of um, sniffing it and um, um, sniffing them and tasting them. Um, um, and I've occasionally seen this, um, uh, seen this in hikers. Um, I've seen it with um, a patient who drank a Bloody Mary with a stalk of celery, um, and the celery was rubbing against her upper lip, and she had a interesting linear, um, an interesting linear streak there. We differentiate between a phototoxic reaction and a photoallergic reaction. So um, a phototoxic reaction means it can happen in absolutely anyone. You have these two things. You have the plant with the furocumarins, and you have um, sunlight, and you, um, if you have enough of it, you're going to get a reaction. Allergies just happen if you develop an, develop an allergy, um, and there are some um, allergies that can be more photo distributed. This is usually an accidental exposure. Nobody goes out and says they'd like to get this rash with the juice or sap from the plant, followed by sun exposure. Again, the plants contain these furocumarins, and the wavelengths of light um, for the exposure are UVA, and um, our current sunblocks just aren't amazing at UVA. Um, and so, uh, and most of us don't use enough sunscreen. So there is often an exposure to UVA pr um, producing the cell membrane damage, um, DNA damage leading to early stages of inflammation. Or you might see erythema, you might see blisters more like a traditional um, poison ivy or contact dermatitis rash, but sometimes that stage is really mild and the patient misses it, but it heals with a striking post-inflammatory pigmentation with him can last for quite a while. Um, the differential would, would include, include an allergic contact dermatitis or some kind of injury to the skin, which the patient would probably know about it. If you catch it in an inflammatory stage, you can treat it with topical steroids, but, we, but this type of pigmentation just doesn't respond well to any of our known bleaching agents. So it's just time and um, you know trying to uh, have the patient be easy compulsive about sun protection. So, um, so you don't keep feeding it and stimulating the pigmentation cells. Questions, is it bothersome? Cosmetically, it's very bothersome. Um, and you, you know, and as I said, it's, um, it's probably in like the top five of, of case, maven cases I've seen so far, because it's not something you would typically think about. Um, and so patients complain about it. Nobody wants to have that pigmentation on the face. They're frustrated about it and it can take quite, um, uh, quite some time to fade away, but it's nothing serious. You can reassure them. And if you're smart enough to look at that patient and say, hey, you know, have you had any exposure where you've eaten or drunken outside? What have you had? 
um, you'll look very smart when you make this diagnosis because it's, it's definitely not something that a patient would come in having thought about. Okay, question for any questions before we move to number four. Um, the question is, do you have, um, can you please recommend a favorite sun blocker? So um, my favorite sun block is whatever a patient will want to use. Um, uh, a typical sunscreen, sunscreens are divided into physical and chemical sunscreens. The physical sunscreen ingredients are the zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. Their superhero strength is they um, sort of form a shield over the top of the skin. And as the ultraviolet light tries to, you know, hits the skin, it, bounce, it bounces off of that. The problem is patients don't like the feel of it. They tend to feel um, stickier. They can look a little white on the skin, especially in skin of color. Um, and so compliance with them is definitely um, an issue. Um, the chemical sunscreens are absorbed into um, the skin. So they, um, they are sitting around the, um, the cells in the epidermis and their superhero strength is as the ultraviolet light comes to the skin and it's absorbed, um, it binds to it and keeps it from going to the cells causing, um, causing DNA damage. Those certainly feel much nicer on the skin because they um, rub in. But the problem is, is the, we only have two ingredients approved in the US, um, avobenzone and mixoral, and the mixoral is proprietary to the expensive La Roche-Posay line. Um, and the avobenzone isn't the most um, stable of molecules. So to me, my favorite sunscreens are the ones that um, combine uh, chemical and physical sunscreen because you have the advantage of the physical sunscreen, um, but it's absorbed into the skin. And anything from Neutrogena to Eucerin to Supergoop, whatever your patient wants to use, they want to use a cream, an ointment. My daughter for a period of time went through a, only a glitter sunscreen um, on, her, on her skin. Um, my husband will only use a spray. Um, the issue where sunscreens fail is that most people don't put on enough. So if um, when they assign the sunscreen the number, and the number just refers to UVB um, protection, um, it's based on a precise amount per square inch. So for example, if it would take you 10 minutes to burn and you put on an SPF of four, in the precise way that it that it's tested in the lab, which is two grams per centimeter squared, it should take you 40 minutes to burn. So an SPF of eight would take you 80 minutes to, to burn. So at some point you keep doubling this and it's just gonna take hours and the stuff doesn't even last that long. But when you hand somebody a sunscreen, you say, here, put this on and you measure how much they've actually used, the average person puts on a third of the amount of the sunscreen that it's tested in the lab. So the number refers to UVB and I ask my patients to get it minimum 30, ideally 50 or more with the thought being if they're putting on a 30, I'm lucky if they're getting an eight because it's a log logarithmic. Um, so, um, so if we aim for a higher concentration, hopefully they'll have enough to not get a, um, to not get a terrible sunburn. There, that was a long, an answer to, long answer to the question, but um, and in, in, my, in my office, I just have a list I hand them and because uh, yeah, that's really what, they, that really what they wanna know, but you guys should understand it. And so that if you're looking at products, you'll, um, you'll, you'll know what it is. There okay. is one more question, Dr. Salab, and I'm not mm -hmm. sure if this goes with the case or if it's maybe we should answer at the end, but it's what are fluorocormarins and are they in food relationship to anticoagulant warfarin? No, um, absolutely no relation. It's um, which um, it is a, a molecule that um, uh, when exposed to UVA light can create in, in the skin can create this toxic reaction. We used it therapeutically for many years with um, a type of phototherapy for psoriasis called PUVA. Um, the P stand for sorlin, which was a furocumarin. And what patients would do is they would take that pill orally and it would make them um, much, much more sensitive to the UVA light, which we knew was toxic. So you were able to give much less um, UVA light as part of their, um, as part of their phototherapy. Uh, that's all been replaced. Nobody's doing PUVA anymore. So we've known about this molecule for a long time in terms of um, making our skin more sensitive to UVA light, but it has nothing to do with antioxidants and it's just a topical um, skin rash. Okay, and I think last question, what is the easiest way to know to how much to put? What is the easy way to know how much to put that it is enough? And I think that's with like the sun. Block. Oh, the sunscreens. So, um, so to cover your body wearing a bathing suit would be a shot glass. 
um, full, so it would be a full ounce. So if you're spending, let's say if you're spending six hours at the beach and you should be applying every two hours, you should go through um, a three ounce bottle of sunscreen. What I tell patients to do is to put on their sunscreen as if you, they think they did a really good job, go have breakfast, go do something else and come back and put another layer on. Um, as an aside, there was an interesting study since there's some questions about sunscreen where they looked at golfers um, uh, and they all put sunscreen on the, however they wanted to put it on before they started their 18 holes of golf. Um, and then one group was asked to reapply after nine holes and the other group was asked to reapply after the second hole. Um, and then at, they brought them into the office um, every day for the next few days and looked at sunburn and, and tanning. And it actually turned out that the group that reapplied after the second hole had much less uh, skin damage, much less evidence of sunburns um, and tanning. And the theory was is that so few people put on enough sunscreen in the beginning that by putting it on soon after they started, they were getting a second layer and getting closer to the recommended amount and therefore their skin was better protected than the people that weren't so well protected when they first started they had to play two hours or nine holes um, and then reapply. So I tell people to, to um, focus on putting on, on layers. Um, and if they, they feel like they put on a lot, then that's great. Okay, I think we answered all the questions. Awesome. Okay, so 22 year old female with a sudden on fit, onset of this painful um, itchy rash. Um, and here we see, um, uh, just one part of her face with, with these lesions. Anyone want to take a stab at describing them? So, um, uh, so crusted papules and erosions, exactly right. So what I'm seeing here um, are um, these fairly monomorphous, meaning they kind of all seem at the same stage of these small, round, punched out, crusted erosions. Um, some of them, such as on the lateral canthus, are grouped together. Um, some are more discrete. Um, some of them have an overlying uh, crust. Um, some, uh, some are fresher and don't, but they seem to be more or less in the same stages of development. What I'm also seeing is the background skin doesn't look completely normal. There's some background redness, especially on this upper eyelid where you have this ill-defined erythematous scaly patch that seems lichenified, this accentuation of the uh, lines of skin, skin demarcation. Um, anybody have an idea of what this might be? So herpes zoster, that's a good thought. Um, the idea of this being herpetic is a really good idea. Um, even though you don't see any blisters, it's probably because the roof of the blister was pretty superficial. These were very small and those are gone. So this grouping of erosions is a really, um, is a really good thought. This is, um, because I'm just showing you this one side, zoster would be a reasonable thought, maybe a few days into it. But if I told you it was bilateral, um, the other condition I want you guys to think about is um, eczema herpeticum. And here's another, um, another case of it. Um, eczema herpeticum is a, um, uh, usually takes place in a patient with a known um, uh, eczematous rash. It's been most commonly described with atopic dermatitis, but it's been reported with other inflammatory conditions, um, uh, seborrhea, um, rare genetic conditions like Haley Haley or ichthyosis. And basically we have a damaged skin barrier and the herpes simplex virus, you know, maybe starting as a cold sore has a chance to spread like wildfire. Spread like wildfire. Um, patients are really uncomfortable with it, um, uh, both itchy and burning sensation. And sometimes they can be quite sick because it's such an extensive herpetic infection. I'm bringing these pictures of more classic herpes simplex. I, I realize that these are more pustules than vesicles, but actually I like this picture because you can see them better. And what you see, See with classic herpes is the grouping of these individual lesions grouping to be more coalescent. And what I want you to look at is the border um, around these group, grouped ones where it's almost like a little indented here, almost like a scallop shell, a little bit of a scallop border. You can see on the picture on the left, 
on the at three o'clock, you can see this kind of scalloping. And when we look at our patient here, for example, that lateral canthus lesion, this border seems to have that same kind of scalloping. And you could just imagine that this might have been a grouping of those vesicles and then pustules that are now eroded, the roofs have come off, but to have that same condition. Eczema herpeticum can be really serious. Patients can be sick. And when it's extensive like this, often I'll recommend they be admitted to the hospital for IV antivirals to try to, um, to, try to calm this down. Um, uh, again, uh, you can see the striking grouping, the striking erosions in this patient with skin of color. You might not appreciate the background um, inflammatory rash as much. Um, again, on um, like kenified or thickened skin, these sort of monomorphous, closely set, grouped, crusted erosions. Um, this is impetigo, and that would have been another differential to think about, especially with the crusting. Um, on the left is impetigo on the face, the right is on the buttocks. Um, bullous impetigo is so interesting because um, it, you, you get these, can get these very superficial blisters, but they're very hard to find. It's caused by a toxin in the staph aureus, um, cleaving the cells that keep our um, top skin cells, our epidermis um, together. And it's not uncommon for eczema herpeticum to be secondarily infected, but if you don't think about the herpes piece of it, when you see this and you see this striking similar morphology of um, the scallop border and the crusted erosions, yes, this patient definitely needs treatment for staph. They need an ophthalmology consult, but you don't want to miss the herpes piece of it. So, um, so although this isn't a common condition, um, it's common enough and I put it into the must not miss category. If you don't think about it, you're not gonna treat them for the virus and you're not gonna consider prophylaxing them for the virus in, um, uh, in, future, um, in future cases. So eczema hermeticum is often um, usually a preceding atopic dermatitis. Um, you can see it in other disorders of the skin barrier. It tends to come all at once, the sudden onset of painful punched out monomorphous, meaning it all has a very similar form, crusted lesions. It's caused by disse dissemination of one of the herpes simplex viruses. But often you miss those primary vesicles. They're tiny and the roof is very delicate and it comes off. Patients might not feel well, um, might have lymphadenopathy. Um, and the antivirals can certainly at a minimum shorten the duration, but in a severe case, um, people can be really sick with it. Questions? So you recommend Shingrix as prevention? So Shingrix is for um, the herpes zoster virus, not the herpes simplex virus. We don't yet have a vaccine for that. And Shingrix is recommended for patients over 50. And I absolutely recommend it for prevention of herpes zoster. But this is caused by the herpes simplex virus, which is the virus in cold sores and genital herpes kind of disseminating out of control in patients with a broken skin barrier. So um, I would love to have a vaccine for herpes simplex in my lifetime. It's a scourge of a lot of misery because once you get this virus, you get to keep it forever, but um, we don't have it yet. No other questions. All right, um, I have us at five to two. Do you guys want to do another case or stop oh, here? I apologize, there is a question. Um, so do you recommend suppression? In a patient that has this and is prone to it, I probably would recommend a daily suppressive dose. Um, you know, an adult, I might use valacyclovir 500 milligrams a day. Um, a child, I would use acyclovir with, um, you know, with weight-based uh, weight -based dosing. Okay, I think we can move on. All right, um, it's five to two, do you guys, I mean, I'm, I have seven cases I can keep going, but I didn't know what your timing was. Um, I know we generally stop at the top of the hour. Um, we'll just pause for one second to see if any qu more questions come in. If not, maybe we can just get one more case in. But just a reminder, if you do have any questions after this presentation or you know specific cases that you can always use the e-consult platform and uh, get your answers to the questions then. Thanks. Um, so this is, um, I guess, a little bit of a different case, um, which is that if you look at um, a survey of um, inpatients who are admitted with cellulitis, especially of the lower extremities, 
um, in a dermatologist is called in 30% of the time the diagnosis is changed. Um, so I think patients get way over uh, diagnosed and over treated for cellulitis when it's really something else. So um, this is a thumbs up, thumbs down. Is it cellulitis? Um, so here's our first patient um, where we see these um, on the bilateral distal lower extremities, um, these um, erythematous confluent scaly uh, patches, um, proximally they're more macules. There's a bit of a dusky kind of um, color to the erythema and you can see on his, um, maybe he's a little heavier, maybe he has some edema um, and you can see some um, spider veins and small varicose veins if you look at his feet. Is it cellulitis? Thumbs up, thumbs down. No. No, beautiful. This is stasis dermatitis. Um, I, have, I don't think I've ever seen a case of bilateral cellulitis. So if the patient's coming in um, uh, where it's bilateral, even if you're thinking cellulitis, just pause, say maybe can't, maybe can't. Um, case number two. Here I'm just showing you one leg. So maybe this is unilateral, maybe bilateral. Um, and you're seeing, um, again, um, erythematous scaly plaques, but the background skin is, um, is different. It's firm if you touch it. There are sort of these um, uh, elephantiasis or rugose thickening of the skin. There's some hyperkeratosis here and hyperpigmentation. Is this cellulitis? elephantiasis lymphedema, exactly right. Now this patient might be prone to cellulitis, but unless they're febrile, that it's really warm, there's a clear change from their baseline, it's not cellulitis. We saw this case, a case like this at the very beginning, we're seeing a tense bulla here, perhaps there's a little bit of background erythema um, on this leg, is it cellulitis? No, 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 you're right. This is a bolus arthropod bite where there's so much edema, um, it's causing the epidermis to separate from the dermis. Bug bites, if it's bad enough to have that much edema, definitely might have some redness that might be warm as well, um, but more likely the patient is itchy and otherwise feeling um, well, so it is not cellulitis. I've definitely seen these patients come in on, um, come in on antibiotics. Is this cellulitis? We have a unilateral on the calf. Um, these erythematous uh, patches, the board with, with scale, the border seems to be an angrier erythema than in the middle. Um, you have these sort of discrete erythematous macules with um, a little bit of central clearing and they're coalescing to these larger patches with this serpiginous irregular border. Is this cellulitis? No. Um, EAC is a good thought. Um, uh, EAC, the classic would have a trailing edge of scale, meaning that the scale wouldn't be right up at the periphery. This is tinea. This is tinea corporis. It's the tinea word for when it's on the body. Um, and it's scaly. Um, the reason why tinea is typically annular, which is um, uh, ring-shaped, is as the body's immune system is trying to shed off and get rid of the fungus, the fungus is spreading out more, you know, is moving, is moving, saying, hmm, he's trying to shed me off. I'm hanging on here. Let me move a little further out, and that's why this can be um, uh, um, this can be annular. It wouldn't surprise me if this patient, so extensive, was initially mistreated with topical steroids, um, and that can very much confuse the appearance of um, the appearance of tinea. Um, how about this patient? It is bilateral, so we're already we're thinking no. We have these painful um, erythematous. When you feel them, they feel kind of indurated nodules on both shins. Oops, sorry. Um, any idea what this is? NLD is a thought. Paniculitis is exactly right, which is an inflammation of the fat layer. Um, and this is erythema nodosum. And it's usually a secondary reaction to either a, um, a distant infectious process um, or, um, a, or a medication in half of the cases we don't know. But because they're warm and tender, um, they can sometimes, these patients can sometimes be treated for cellulitis. Um, this, we have this um, pretty angry erythematous patch and in the center of which um, we're seeing a more violaceous erythema. Um, we're seeing some, over, um, some erosions and overlying scale. Um, is this cellulitis? Could be cellulitis, I definitely would think that. 
Um, this patient was hiking in the woods and got uh, um, uh, probably got a tick bite. Um, and this is erythema uh, migrans um, or, um, or Lyme disease. So um, if you mis made a mistake and treated this patient with an antibiotic, if you treated them long enough and with something for Lyme disease, you would do a good job. It's not always the classic target lesion um, that you would expect on the leg. This would be a more classic one where their target um, could be um, a little darker in the center and, and a little red around it. This is more, our patient here is more of an inflammatory reaction, but, um, but Lyme disease would be something to think about. How about this patient? It's unilateral. Um, uh, it's on the butt extending down to on the thigh. We have this right angry um, erythematous macules, but mostly patches um, within which are these um, are darker areas, which probably represent the roof of blisters that are getting ready to fall off. Again, that um, scalloped kind of border. Um, and this is herpes aster. So this would not be, um, this would not be uh, cellulitis. And our last one, um, is unilateral. Um, it's a um, sort of a dusky erythematous patch. There were two clues here. Um, one is a little bit of an erosion, one is a central pustule, and it's got this irregular border. It's warm and, and tender, and you guys got it, cellulitis. All right, beautiful. I think we'll stop there. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for presenting. This was fantastic. I really enjoyed the whole cases. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Remember the CME survey will pop up. So please uh, complete that. And if you ever have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Dr. Salab on our eConsult platform. You guys were great. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you.